Welcome to session 73 of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. This time around, we're going to be looking at some works by Thomas Ligotti that I'll tell you about in just a bit. For anybody who is new to the series, this is an ongoing monthly set of examinations of world building and philosophical themes in speculative fictions, usually spanning a number of short stories and or novels. And we've been doing this since 2016 when we partnered with the Brookfield Public Library. At first they were in-person sessions held more or less each month. And then with COVID, we moved online into the format that you see at present where we have a, usually I try to shoot for 90 minute video that premieres. We have live chat. Uh, this time around, it's gonna be a bit longer than that, I'm afraid. And then we follow it up with a more intimate video conferencing session through Zoom, talking uh, with each other about the, the books, the ideas, following up and exploring things in even more depth. So this time around, as I mentioned, we're doing Thomas Ligotti. Uh, he has been somebody requested for quite a long time by fans, uh, suggested by colleagues. And so we were supposed to do him last year. He actually made it in one of the votes that I do near the end of the year each time around and we just didn't get to him. So we're doing him this year. And uh, I'm actually, this is one of those uh, times when I'm very happily surprised by the high quality of what has been recommended to me. Shouldn't be a huge surprise at this point because nearly all of the recommendations that I've got have turned out to be quite excellent. Um, but this is actually, something quite extraordinary, I would say. And so we're going to be looking at um, a number of his short stories as we find them in several of his collections. I've got here his Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grim Scribe. Those were his two first story collections. And, you know, it's quite a, a volume here. We obviously won't be looking at every single story, but we'll be examining some common themes in quite a few. And then we have uh, some more recent works, uh, Noctuary, and uh, the very short, The Spectral Link, which only has two stories, both of which I think are, are quite important in it. And this is supplemented by a nonfiction book, essentially a, wor a work of philosophy that Ligotti wrote a while back called The Conspiracy, against the human race, um, which has been quite influential, uh, not just in the worlds of uh, fiction, but also, you know, there's quite a few philosophers that are interested in checking this out. Now, I titled this uh, session Thomas Ligotti's uh, Tales of, of uh, Philosophical Horror, but it's also Supernatural Horror, and we're going to be looking at his like massive articulated worldview, which is often summarized as pessimism, sometimes as nihilistic, and how that is going to play out in his stories, which are all within the horror or weird genre. And Lagodi himself has a number of thoughts about this, which we're going to be looking at later on, taken from his own interviews. Um, his biography also plays an important role, so we're going to be spending a good bit of time looking at that. Uh, but we're also going to be exploring some selections of philosophical themes that, that are articulated in Conspiracy Against the Human Race and then found in his stories in narrative form. There's a few stories in which he's actually doing something a bit similar to conspiracy against the human race, but in a smaller space, you could say, right? And so we'll also look at some of those stories as well. And before we look at his biography at length and the, you know, let's call it the effects 
that uh, undergoing various forms of mental illness, or as they used to call it, uh, alienation, has produced in his work and you know the backdrop of his own life uh, and how that plays a role in, in his stories. Uh, and before we go on to looking at what he says about his own work uh, through the media of interviews, that is talking with an interlocutor about things, I think that we have to spend a bit of time, since this is worlds of speculative fiction, talking about uh, not so much the world building as such, because you could say that what, what's going into Lagodi's stories, even as early as these very first collections, is a reflection of what he is articulating later on in Conspiracy Against the Human Race. So I, I think we probably ought to, in order to set the stage properly, talk about um, world building in relation to deeper world view, where the stories uh, and the incompletely uh, uh, presented world, because we never get some sort of totalizing vision of everything on the part of Ligoti in his stories, uh, covering every one of his stories, we never get that, um, but it is undergirded by his as admittedly pessimistic worldview. So that's what we'll go into first as we explore these uh, great works. And, um, you know, we'll make our way through. Obviously, we're not going to get to every single story or even philosophical point made in these works, but we can certainly do much more than scratch the surface. I, I'm going to say one other thing, too, by way of, um, I guess you could call it narrative before we jump into this. So I had intended to do this earlier, not just in terms of, you know, in an earlier year, but an earlier time this month, and what I discovered, interestingly, perhaps mysteriously, we could even say, is that Thomas Ligotti's works are not that easy to find in local libraries. So, you know, at the um, really excellent, usually, Milwaukee uh, Central Library, which is just a beautiful structure, has uh, four levels of storage tiers full of books down below. Uh, they didn't really have too many of his works available. Um, these, you know, Spectral Link and Noctuary, and then Conspiracy Against the Human Race. And I put in a request, because they do have a copy of this, Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grimscribe, and it's still out at this point, it hasn't been returned. It's overdue and I couldn't get my hands on it. Now, I have library privileges at a local university library as well, Marquette University, which again is usually quite excellent, even for fiction works. And I went into the catalog and found that the only book by Lagodi that they actually list as being in their holdings is Noctuary, they don't even have uh, the conspiracy against the human race. So I was kind of surprised by this. And so we ended up having to order Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grim Scribe so that I wouldn't be simply going by internet PDFs that I managed to scrape together and could actually hold the book in my hand as I'm talking about it with you. And I'm, I'm very happy to have this. Uh, it's, it's quite different reading a book as a book that you have a physical copy of rather than merely a uh, PDF facsimile. So uh, these are the works that we're going to be looking at. So um, I hope that you enjoy the discussion of these works as much as I and perhaps you enjoy these works themselves. What are the features of the narrative universe that Thomas Ligotti has constructed his short stories and indeed we could even say his nonfiction work within? There's 
a show from the 1980s that I saw as a kid that perhaps some of you have encountered before, but I'm not recommending the show as such, but it had a really striking intro and outro that I think are reflective of Thomas Ligotti's vision of, of things, as we're going to look at it in a few of his stories and his conspiracy against the human race. And that show was called Tales from the Dark Side. If you haven't seen the intro, Google it. And it is very interesting and creepy. And it begins by saying, man lives in the sunlit world of what he believes to be reality, but there is, unseen by most, an underworld, a place that is just as real but not as brightly lit, a dark side. And with the television thing, again, you can look it up, you'll see this like transformation of this nice forest scene into something macabre, something uncanny, something scary. The closing part, again, reminiscent of what's going on in Ligotti's works, the dark side is always there waiting for us to enter, waiting to enter us. Until next time, try to enjoy the daylight is then how it is framed. So um, that's a great way of encapsulating a good bit of what's going on in Ligotti's work. And before we look at the conspiracy against the human race, there's a few, let's call them didactic stories that I think are worth checking out. Showing that, you know, long before he writes that book, a lot of these ideas are being articulated. And so Professor Nobody's Little Lectures is a great one. And I'm not going to read all of it, although the entire thing is, is well worth reading. I'm going to start with Pessimism and Supernatural Horror Lecture 1. Madness, chaos, bone-deep mayhem, devastation of innumerable souls while we scream and perish. History licks a finger and turns the page. Fiction unable to compete with the world for vividness of pain and lasting effects of fear compensates in its own way. How? By inventing more bizarre means to outrageous ends. Among these means, of course, is the supernatural. In transforming natural ordeals into supernatural ones, we find the strength to affirm and deny their horror simultaneously, to savor and suffer them at the same time. So this is projecting supernatural horror as if it's something that we we could say create as fictions, whether in literature or in ghost stories or our own little private mythologies and experiences. And so he goes on and he says, supernatural horror is the product of a profoundly divided species of being, our being. It is not the pastime of even our closest relations in the holy natural world. We gained it as part of our gloomy inheritance when we became what we are. Once awareness of the human predicament was achieved, we immediately took off in two directions, splitting ourselves down the middle. One half became devoted, dedicated to apologetics, even celebration of our new toy of consciousness. The other half condemned and occasionally launched direct, direct assaults on this gift. Now, which is supernatural horror? Well, not, not either. Supernatural horror was one of the ways we found that would allow us to live with our double selves. By its employ, we discovered how to take all the things that victimize us in our natural lives and turn them into the very stuff of demonic delight in our fantasy lives. In story and song, we could entertain ourselves with the worst we could think of, overriding real pains with ones that were unreal and harmless to our species. We can also do this trick without trespassing onto the property of supernatural horror, but then we risk running into miseries that are too close to home. So that's the first part. And then we have Pessimism and Supernatural Horror Lecture 2. And he deepens this analysis. He tells us that um, 
The logic of supernatural horror is founded on fear, a logic whose sole principle states existence equals nightmare. Unless life is a dream, nothing makes sense. For as a reality, it is a rank failure. Uh, and he goes on, that we all deserve punishment by horror is as mystifying as it is undeniable to become an accomplice, however involuntarily, in a reasonless non-reality is cause enough for the harshest sentencing. But we've been trained so well to accept the order of an unreal world, we do not rebel against it. How could we, where pain and pleasure form a corrupt alliance against us, Paradise and hell are merely different divisions in the same monstrous bureaucracy. And between these two poles exists everything we know or can ever know. It is not even possible to imagine a utopia, earthly or otherwise, that can stand up under the mildest criticism. But one must take into account the shocking fact that we live on a world that spins. And he goes on and he says... On rare occasions, we do overcome hopelessness or velleity and make mutinous demands to live in a real world, one that is at least episodically ordered to our advantage. But perhaps it is only a demon of some kind that moves us to such idle insubordination, the more so to aggravate our condition in the unreal. After all, is it not wondrous that we're allowed to be both witnesses and victims of the sep sep <laughs> sepulchral pomp of wasting tissue. And one thing we know is real. So up until this point, you know, horror is sort of an escape from the real. One thing we know is real. Horror. It is so real, in fact, that we cannot be sure it could not exist without us. Yes, it needs our imaginations and our consciousness, but it does not ask or require our consent to use them. Indeed, horror operates with complete autonomy. All said, we must face up to it. Horror is more real than we are. The last thing I'll, I'll read from this very quickly is just from the final section, Sardonic Harmony. It says, compassion for human hurt, a humble sense of our impermanence, an absolute valuation of justice. All our so-called virtues only trouble us and serve to bolster, not assuage, horror. In addition, these qualities are our least vital, the least in line with life. More often than not, they stand in the way of one's rise in the welter of the world, which found its pace long ago and has not deviated from it since. The putative affirmations of life, each of them based on the propaganda of tomorrow, reproduction, revolution in as wide as sense, piety in any form you can name are only affirmations of our desire. So he goes on and says, by means of supernatural horror, we may evade, if momentarily, the horrific reprisals of affirmation. Every one of us having been stolen from non-existence opens his eyes on the world and looks down the road at a few convulsions and a final obliteration. What a weird scenario. So why affirm anything? Why make a pathetic virtue of a terrible necessity? And he says, since there's no one around to do the mocking, we'll take on the job. Let us indulge in cruel pleasures against ourselves and our pretensions. Let us delight in the cosmic macabre, right? So supernatural horror is not something that is just you know, made up on top of the brutal real world that we have, it comes out of it as a reflection of our own consciousness and our connection to something more. So this is a great opportunity to look at um, his essay, Who Goes There in um, Conspiracy Against the Human Race and the discussion of the uncanny. And so he says... Um, most of us share a general pattern of feeling about what is right or wrong in a moral sense, and we also share a general pattern of feeling about what is right or wrong with respect to the world and ourselves. An internal authority that judges entities and events as within or outside the customs of reality. In experiencing the uncanny, there is a feeling of wrongness. A violation has transpired that alarms our internal authority regarding how something is supposed to happen or exist or behave. An offense against our world conception or self-conception has been committed. Of course, our internal authority may itself be in the wrong, perhaps because it is a fabrication of consciousness based on a body of laws that are written only within us. 
and not a detector of what is right or wrong in any real sense, since nothing really is right or wrong in any real sense. That we might be wrong about something being wrong would itself be wrong, according to our internal authority, which would then send out a signal of the uncanny concerning its own wrongness that would be returned to it for another round of signaling on the principle that everything it knows is wrong, which is to say that something is always wrong. For the welfare of our functioning, we're, in, we're insured against the adverse effect of an ever-cycling signal of uncanny wrongness by our inability to recognize it, although it might be going on all the time, thus accounting for our uneasiness about something. But we may still perceive other phenomena to be on the wrong side of right and wrong, things that should not happen or exist or behave in the way we feel that they should. So, very interesting set of observations there. Our consciousness for Lagodi goes out, you know, and helps form the world. This is very much drawn from people like Schopenhauer and, and Nietzsche, but also, you know, it, according to him, uh, you know, more recent figures as well, including scientists. And we have a world that certainly has scope for horror and the uncanny within it because of the fundamental wrongnesses, which we have projected out there. Um, I'm going to skip back a little bit into The Nightmare of Being, where he talks about the motif of supernatural horror. What is it? Something terrible in its being comes forward and makes its claim as a shareholder in our reality. Or what we think is our reality and ours alone. It may be an emissary from the grave or an esoteric monstrosity. It may be the offspring of a scientific experiment with unintended consequences, or uh, it may be a hideous token of another dimension revealed only in a mythic tome, as in the yellow sign. Or it may be a world onto itself of pure morbidity, one suffused with a profound sense of a doom without a name, Edgar Allan Poe's world. Then he goes on. Reflected in the world, works of many supernatural writers, the signature motif Schopenhauer made discernible in pessimism was most consistently promulgated by Lovecraft, a paragon among literary figures who have thought the unthinkable, or at least thought what most mortals do not want to think, in conceiving Azathoth, that nuclear chaos which bubbles at the center of all eternity, Lovecraft may well have been thinking of Schopenhauer's will. As instantiated in Lovecraft's stories, the pernicious something that makes a nightmare of our world is individuated into linguistically tetralogical entities from beyond or outside of our universe. <clears throat> like ghosts or the undead, their very existence spooks us as a violation of what should and should not be, suggesting unknown modes of being and uncanny creations which epitomize supernatural horror. Let's come back to uh, the uh, stories. One of the interesting stories that he has in Songs of a Dead Dreamer is called Notes on the Writing of Horror, a story. And he actually, after giving us a, a scary story about a bad pair of pants, <clears throat> he suggests that there are three styles that we can work in. The realistic technique, which uh, you know, essentially starts out with a world that we know and you know things emerge from that but eventually go back into the realism that we started from the traditional gothic technique as he calls it and then finally the experimental technique and he will finish by saying that all the styles we have examined uh have been purified for the purposes of instruction each is uh, a simplified example. In the real world of horror fiction, these three techniques often get entangled with one another in hopelessly strange ways, almost to the point of rendering my previous discussion of them useless. But an ulterior purpose, which I'm saving for later, may be better served. I'd like to briefly propose another style, right? He says that... Um, the story of Nathan is one very close to my heart. I wanted to write this horror tale in such a fashion its readers would be distressed, not by the isolated catastrophe of Nathan, 
but by the very existence of a world where such catastrophe is possible. I wanted to forge a tale that would conjure a mournful universe independent of time, place, and persons. The characters of the story would be death itself and the flesh, desire in a new pair of pants, desiderata within arm's reach, and doom in a size to fit all. And he says, well, I couldn't do this. Let's talk about the final style, then, he says. Uh, the, the, the narrator talks about revealing my own prejudice concerning how a horror story should be written. And he says, horror has a voice proper to itself, but what is it? Is it, is it that of an old storyteller? Uh, is it uh, that of a documentarian? Or is it the yarn-spinning god who can see the unseeable and narrate from an omniscient perspective a scary set of incidents? And he says, no, it's none of those voices. Instead, it's a lonely voice calling out in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's muffled, like the voice of a tiny insect crying for help from inside a sealed coffin. And at a time, the coffin shatters. And from within rises a, pri a cri piercing crystal shriek that lacerates the midnight blackness. In other words, the proper voice of horror is really that of personal confession. And he says, horror is not really horror unless it's your horror, that which you have known personally. You may not be able to get it out of a consummately profound way, but this is where true horror writing must start. And what makes it true is that the confessing narrator always has something he must urgently get off his chest and labors beneath its nightmarish weight all the while while he's telling the tale. So interestingly, at least in the, the presentation of that narrator, horror is going to be something personal. Now, Ligoti thinks that we don't actually have selves in any true philosophical way, as we'll talk about a bit later. So he can ask, well, what what is it? And that's where the who goes there with the reference, uh, interestingly, to the story that would eventually spawn the film, the, hor the horror film, uh, The Thing uh, winds up being there. What am I? And we discover ourselves in the world through horror he is maintaining. Coming back to the conspiracy against the human race, there's, there's one other section that I want to bring up. And this is in Sick to Death, right? And he tells us, this is at the very end of the essay, by means of supernatural horror, we may evade, if momentarily, the horror of the horrific reprisals of affirmation. Every one of us, having been stolen from non-existence, open his eyes on the world, looks down the road at a few convulsions and a final obliteration. This is the bleak, nihilistic viewpoint, right? What a weird scenario. So why affirm anything? Why make a pathetic virtue of a terrible necessity? We are destined to a fool's fate that deserves to be mocked, and since there's no one around to do it, right? Um, this is We've already talked about this a little bit, right? So supernatural horror, as he's going to finish, he says, enables a reader to taste treats inconsistent with his personal welfare. Now, are, is all horror like that? The, the schlocky stuff is scary, but doesn't really affect us long term. The reason why Ligotti's work and the work of those who he lauds as great horror writers, for instance, Lovecraft and Poe and others like that, can have such a profound impact is because it reveals to us a world that is, is certainly fiction, right? But is a fiction in which we can perhaps imaginatively and emotionally enter and uh, a world that we find doesn't work out the way it ought to. Um, I'm going to close this by bringing up a story that that Ligotti says is is you know very important for him, the shadow at the bottom of the world, which is coming from Grimm's scribe. So there's a scarecrow, and weird things are happening around it. So they go and they start tearing away the coverings of the scarecrow, and what is 
found. Um, here we go. Um, there's a long description. From the skeleton of the thing, for the skeleton of the thing should have been merely two crosswise planks. The shape that stood before us was of a wholly different nature. It was something black and twisted into the form of a man, something that seemed to have come up out of the earth and grown over the wooden planks like a dark fungus consuming the structure. There were now black legs that hung as if charred and withered. There was a head that sagged like a sack of ashes upon a meager body of blackness. There were thin arms stretched like knobby branches from a lightning-scorched tree. All of this was supported by a thick, dark stalk which rose from the earth and reached into the effigy like a hand into a puppet. Very important theme that we're going to look at later, the notion of the puppet. And he says... Uh, its composition appeared to be of the blackest earth, of earth that had gone stagnant somewhere in its depths where a rich loam had festered into a bog of shadows. Even when we ventured to lay our hands on the mass of darkness, we found only greater mysteries. They, they're unable to destroy it. And then what ends up happening is they start digging around the earth. They dug very deep, but it wasn't enough to reach the bottom of that sprouting blackness. Our attempts became hindered by a perverse reluctance in the instance of someone who's hesitant to have a diseased part of his own body cut away in order to keep the disease from spreading. So they come back later and what happened? It's gone, the farmer revealed to us. Gone into the, into the earth like something hiding in its shell. Don't walk there. We gathered about the edge of this opening in the ground, gazing into its depths. Even full daybreak did not show us the bottom of that dark well. Our speculations were brief and futile. Some of us picked up the shovels lying nearby as if to begin the long duty of filling in the great aperture. No use in that, said the farmer. He then found a large stone and dropped it straight down the shaft. We waited and waited. We put our heads close to the hole and listened. But all we seemed to hear were remote humming echoes as of countless voices of insects chattering unseen. And, uh, you know, so we've got here a bo you know, seemingly bottomless pit, right? And eventually what is going to happen is this thing will walk uh, by them again. And we, we hear this interesting thing. We knew what needed to happen. A season was upon us of all seasons, and an aberration had risen that did not belong to the course of life we had always known. It grew out of the earth in a farmer's field, and beneath it was a bottomless hole that we covered with a mound of dirt, thereby denying a hungering presence what it asked of us. Unsated, it would now take what it desired. As frightened as we were, we also felt resentment and outrage. From the beginning, there was an exchange to which we'd resigned ourselves. That which is given must one day be given back, the course of life. In time, the eternal darkness would arrive as each of our lives was reclaimed at its end and went back to the earth that had borne our bodies and sustained them with its plenty. But the phenomenon we confronted seem nothing less than a premature craving, a greed surpassing our covenant with Earth's estate. What we were forced to stipulate then was another, perhaps more fundamental order of being than our species had suspected, even a betrayal or deception on the part of creation itself. All that was left to us was to wonder, who knows all that is innate to this world or to any other? Why should there not be something buried deep within appearances? Something that wears a mask to hide itself behind the visibility of nature. So, closing on this, supernatural horror, sort of like we can go down rabbit holes. Well, rabbit holes may turn out not to be just mere rabbit holes. And something else may come up as, to, going back to this, sometimes we discover the dark side. Sometimes the dark side discovers us and enters into us. But that's a reflection of an unseen order that is more, you know, fundamental than what our consciousnesses project outward and what our society constantly churns to keep us 
at ease and to keep all of these reflections at bay. So a little bit of the landscape of Ligotti's narratives uh, encapsulated in that. Obviously, there's much more yet to explore. With any author who we haven't already covered in the worlds of speculative fiction series, we want to delve into their biography a bit, not just for the trivia of, you know, when this book was published or what award they won, but to get a better sense of who they are as an author and the influences, the experiences, the setbacks, the successes. And with Ligoti, this is very important as we're going to find out he's a living author, but he's rather reclusive. So this gives us some sort of insight that we can draw in part from, you know, uh, various biographies that are out there on the, the Internet, but also from interviews with him and even some stuff that's coming from the outside as we're going to See, so Ligoti is born in Detroit, Michigan, in 1953. So this is a time when Detroit is sort of at the peak of its um, success as a city. If you don't know much about Detroit, it is a cautionary tale for the Midwest Rust Belt. At one time, Detroit was the fourth largest city in the United States, and it's now, you know, it's not a wasteland as such, but it's a city with many, many challenges. And the decline took several decades, and there have been efforts to try to reverse it, but none of them have been entirely successful. So this is part of what shapes Ligoti. He's born to uh, Gasper and Dolores Ligoti, uh, second generation. Uh, he's a second generation American of predominantly Sicilian heritage. As a young boy, he was hospitalized and operated on for an abdominal rupture. And he also tells us that um, in one of his interviews, I was a fairly devout Catholic as a child, less so as a teenager, not at all since my late teens. He, he talks about this in some of his essays, you know, sense of Catholic worry and guilt being sort of, you know, brought into his existence. He talks about this in interviews as well. And then he said that uh, after that, he got into, you know, this or that, this or that sort of Eastern doctrine, one guru after another. He would get excited with a new spiritual toy and then become bored or ir irritated and then lapsing back into nothing. So he says, I took religion very seriously as a child, but abandoned it in my late teens. And he also tells us that he was born in Detroit, but he didn't grow up in Detroit itself. He grew up in an upper class suburb that bordered on Detroit. But he says, during high school in the 1960s, I spent some time hanging out in dope houses in Detroit's ghettos. And he also worked in downtown Detroit for 23 years. And he, he got into drinking and, and drugs in part to have uh, some sort of excitement, but also to deal with some of the problems that he was already experiencing and to try to, you know, uh, try them out. So he says that between uh, 11th and 12th grades, he had sort of worked himself out of that. Uh, why? Because he says, I hardly left the house except to attend school why? Because my panic attacks and agoraphobia were very severe and frequent. So already in his teenage years, he's experiencing what we would nowadays call uh, psychological episodes or disorders. And at this time, at a visit during the local drugstore, he found in a bookstall the works of Arthur Machen. And, you know, this is a, a weird horror writer, right? And why in a drugstore? Because back then, and this is part of my childhood growing up in the 70s and 80s, you would go to the drugstore and there would be racks of books. Uh, some of them would be like romance novels or mercenary stuff, but there was lots of sci-fi and fantasy and horror things that you could buy. And it was, it was kind of a common place to actually get your hands on these. So he does that. And then the next year, um, he discovers H.P. Lovecraft and decides that he wants to write himself. 
1971, he actually graduates from Gross Point uh, North High School, and he begins going to the Maycomb County Community College, where he is for about two years, and then uh, begins his studies in English at Wayne State University in Detroit, right, uh, which runs from 1973 to 1978. And he says that around this time he began writing. And, you know, interestingly enough, where would he submit his stuff? Arkham House. They reject everything. Arkham House, why that? Because it's, it's the place uh, founded by uh, August Derleth, among others, that publishes um, a number of weird authors, but especially H.P. Lovecraft. And then he says there was a period, so this is part of his uh, uh, college times, from 1975 to 1979 when I was severely depressed in addition to my panic anxiety disorder. So he's got a new thing to deal with. He says, I was ahedonic all, all day, every day. I thought my existence was over. But I was young, and it was during that period I began to write in earnest. Years went by, and he's very frank about this, and I wrote one bad story after another. Then I wrote The Last Feast of Harlequin, whose narrator is a depressive. It was very bad, but not so bad that I destroyed it. I kept it in an old beer case I used to archive my writing. Every so often I'd read it over again, thinking how I could extract the good parts from the bad. And in the meantime, I began writing stories that were published in small press magazines. Now, he uh, does some work, uh, you know, as a teaching assistant under the Comprehensive Educational Training Act in, in Michigan as well, in Oak Park. And then he gets a job at Gale Research Company, uh, Gale, the publisher, and he has a number of different jobs. He's an editorial assistant, then he becomes an assistant editor, senior assistant editor, associate editor. And this is, you know, fairly quickly. These are year by year. And in the course of that, his first published story, The Chemist, appears uh, in 1981. And he wins uh, from the Small Press Writers and Artists Organization Best Author of Horror Weird Fiction, in 1982, and then in 1983, he goes to the World Fantasy Convention in Ottawa, Canada, doing a little bit of travel for that, and he's continuing to write, and now he's getting some traction while still working at Gale, and he publishes Songs of a Dead Dreamer in 1985, a short story collection, right? And um, he's going to start uh, having some interesting progress. Grimm Scribe, His Lives and Works, 1991. But I want to focus on something else that he brought up in, in another uh, interview. He said, I was drawn to popular music from an early age. I asked for a transistor radio for my birthday once in order to listen to baseball games. I also listened to hockey games while lying in bed on Sunday nights because it was the only sports broadcast at the time. It was depressing listening to broadcasts of hockey, a game in which I had no interest, but I had to listen to something to take my mind off starting another week the next day. Like many people, I found both Sundays and school depressing. Monday wasn't that great either. Coming Tuesday, I felt bad, better. And so he started to listen to local radio shows that played popular music. And he says, All to, afterwards, I stopped listening to sports and only listened to music. This was in the early 60s. And I retain nostalgia for songs of that period, especially songs that had what I perceived as haunting melodies or instrumental hooks. Now, here's where things change a bit. I took up guitar and played lead in a band throughout junior high and most of high school. We played an incredible variety of songs throughout that period and had a particular liking for The Loving Spoonful. Then came blues, blues rock, psychedelia. We became a jam band. I had an unholy terror of performing in public, but I loved music so much I put up with the anxiety. Music ended for me when I had an emotional breakdown and started having multiple panic attacks every day. I didn't pick it up again until college, when I took courses in theory, sight singing, ear training, all that stuff. I was terrified every day. Everyone in class was a music major except me. I worked far more at music than I did at literature and language, what he was supposed to be studying. I started playing classical guitar. I also played electric guitar at home and taught guitar at a music studio for some years as one of my jobs to pay for college. 
and never performed in public again except in music classes. And then he says, in 1975, I stopped listening to music altogether when my first depression hit. Ahedonia, right? That lasted for years. Sometime later in the 70s, I began to feel better and started reading and writing every free moment. So that's what leads him into his work. Um, so in, in uh, 1991, another sort of very important year, he wins uh, the World Fantasy Award for Best Short Fiction for The Last Feast of Harlequin and brings out Grimm Scribe, his second collection. And then he says, in 1991, I decided to call it quits as a writer, but I had to do something, so I started playing guitar again, um, thinking it would be a less stressful activity. I became a complete gu guitar geek, and it wasn't any less stressful than writing. This is around 1993, and here we get another interesting turn. When the company I worked for was going through a reorganization, not its first, I think of 1993 1994, as the time when people working in offices realized their potential for being assholes. That second reorganization disturbed me so much with its blatant idiocies and pod people mentality. I wrote The Nightmare Network. Now I was writing again and playing guitar on top of that. The situation at work kept escalating and its madness and pathos. And I wrote another corporate horror story called I Have a Special Plan for this world. By then, a number of my coworkers actually felt I was going off my rocker and feared that I would do something. I didn't feel I was at that stage yet. It wasn't until 2000, several reorganizations later, that I began to lose it. I became obsessed by violent fantasies. These became the impetus for writing My Work Is Not Yet Done, which we'll get to in just a bit. In the meantime, in the 90s, he publishes Noctuary, which we're going to look at a, a little bit here in just a bit. The Agonizing Resurrection of Victor Frankenstein and Other Gothic Tales. And then in 1996, The Nightmare Factory comes out. Now, The Nightmare Factory is a consolidation, uh, an omnibus from the first three uh, collections. And then there's a concluding section that has new stories, which are then going to be reprinted later on. And this wins the Bram Stoker Award for, uh, you know, collection. And also it wins the, one of the stories, The Red Tower, wins the Bram Stoker Award for short fiction. He also wins the British Fantasy Award for best fiction collection. So this is really putting Ligoti on the map. Um, then something else very interesting happens. 1997, uh, he publishes in a foreign town in a foreign land. And this begins his association with uh, David Tibet's band, Current 93. And so that work is accompanied by a CD, as is also going to be the case for I Have a Special Plan for This World, This Degenerate Little Town, and The Unholy City, published in, in 2000, 2001, and 2002. Now, in 2001, shortly after that other reorganization in 2000, Lagodi says, I'm done. He leaves Gale. He moves to Florida. And actually, you know, his, as we find out, he has uh, some of the family down there. And um, shortly after that, my work is not done. Three Tales of Corporate Horror comes out in 2002. And he does write a few other stories. Our Temporary Supervisor, My Case for Retributive Action. But those are written later. They don't make it into that, that volume. And uh, My Work Is Not Yet Done wins uh, Bram Stoker Award for Best Long Fiction, uh, and it also wins a Horror Guild Award for the Long Form category. In the meantime, in 2003, um, he, uh, well, not he, but, but uh, a publisher, uh, Duturo, publishes Crampton, a screenplay. Now, this is actually originally a X-Files episode, which never gets produced or published or anything like that, but it gets transformed into uh, a feature-length script uh, with Ligoti and Brandon Trents. And so he says, by, you know, 19, uh, the, the 1990s, I was watching the X-Files, and uh, Brandon had this idea for the opening to an X-Files episode, and, um, you know, it sounded like a good episode thing. We could develop it into a script. I was no longer, by 1996, a regular viewer, and I didn't really care that much about it, but I wasn't writing that much in horror fiction. And I thought maybe I'd write, uh, stop writing altogether. So 
you know, in order to keep myself from contemplating my death, I began and invo became involved with Brandon in developing this script, and it does get published in 2003. Um, also in 2003, Sideshow and Other Stories, and then Death Poems. Ligoti actually writes poetry, uh, and then he writes The Shadow at the Bottom of the World and, and publishes that in 2005. Uh, the Nightmare Factory, uh, Extra Materials, towards the end, gets republished as Teatro uh, Grotesco in 2006. And interestingly, what we find, you know, it sounds like he's doing professional writing, but actually, in 2007, we find in, a, in, a, in an interview, he says, for the past few years, I've worked at home as a freelance copy editor. And he tells us what he's been um, doing during the day. People send me editorial projects, either by mail or email. I wake up in the morning and within five minutes, I'm sitting in front of my computer with a cup of coffee. It's intense work and I can't do it for more than five or six hours at a stretch. By then I'm pretty burnt out. I take a long nap in the afternoon to recover. When I wake up, there's emails to answer. That takes an hour or so. My, bro my mother and brother live within walking distance, and I usually have dinner with them and spend the rest of the evening watching TV with them. Then I go home and answer more emails. What you don't notice in there is, here's my routine for writing my stories, right? So um, it's, it's quite interesting to see that he's making his living after leaving Gail by doing all this freelance work. And then what we're going to see leading up to the conspiracy against the, the human race, which is a, a work of nonfiction, right? More or less. Um, Ligoti is, he's, he's engaging in what he calls the examination of the philosophy of madness. And he says it reached its apex in 2000. He finished a major paper on the philosophy of the experience of time and psychosis and the steady flow of, of philosophical deliberation on the subject of psychosis swept me away that summer and plunged me into the heart of the object itself, a full-blown acute psychosis. And so he's got now yet another thing that he's, he's struggling with. And he says that, you know, I demonstrate how my own philosophical attitude led to psychotic praxis. And I argue there's a more common occurrence that is a certain kind of consistent philosophizing may very well result in confusion, paradoxes, unworldly insights, and circular frozen that is reminiscent of madness, which in fact happened to quite a few philosophers who are far from unimportant. Now notice who he actually mentions here, such as Thomas Aquinas. What is he thinking about? Thomas Aquinas's end of life experience. Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche, of course, went insane uh, and was uh, institutionalized, right? And Georg Cantor. Now, Cantor is actually a mathematician, but, you know, he's willing to count him as a philosopher, perhaps because of his work on, on infinity and transfinite numbers, right? Conspiracy Against the Human Race comes out in 2010. And this is, you know, retrospectively, it's, it's Ligoti revealing his own views on life, consciousness, free will, all sorts of things. And it helps us understand his own work, but it's also going to spur a lot of other interesting things. And this wins another Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in Nonfiction. Then we have the Spectral Link coming out in 2014. Again, we'll be looking at a bit of that. In 2014, something else happens that's quite interesting. True Detective, season one, comes out, right? And... Because of the character played by Matthew McConaughey, who, you know, says some nihilistic things, fans of Ligoti notice that this is very similar to what Ligoti is saying in The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. And they start going after the showrunner and writer, Nick uh, Pizzolatto. Uh, and so here's an excerpt from, from uh, uh, the... Um, uh, Lovecraft e-zine website. Mike Davis says, I became increasingly uneasy. It seemed to me that true detective writer Nick uh, Pizzolatto was borrowing words and phrasing from other authors, especially Thomas Ligotti. I expressed my concerns on one of the Lovecraft e-zine video shows, and then I was contacted by John Padgett, the founder of the website Thomas Ligotti Online. As I reviewed John's research and did more of my own, my doubts I had about plagiarism disappeared. 
it became obvious to me that Pizzolatto had plagiarized Thomas Ligotti and others in some places using exact quotes, in others changing a word here and there, paraphrasing in much the same way. A high school student will cheat on an essay by copying somebody else's work and substituting a few words of their own. Now, Pizzolatto didn't credit Ligotti, and eventually he starts getting asked questions about this, and he'll say, oh, well, I was influenced by him, this is an homage, and everyone else is calling BS on that and saying, you can look at what uh, this character is saying, and you can look at what Ligotti's saying, and it's almost a word-for-word -word correspondence, clearly plagiarism, right? Um, going on, also in 2014, uh, Born to Fear interviews with Thomas Ligotti comes out, and then the, um, the Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grim Scribe, again in 2015, uh, republishing. And then in 2019, very cool, he wins a Lifetime Achievement uh, uh, Bram Stoker Award. Um, in uh, 2021, we get a chapbook reprint of one story published in the Spectral Link, The Small People, which we're going to talk about in, in a bit. Uh, and then there's another uh, chapbook, uh, Paradoxes from Hell in 2021. And then the most uh, recent, 2023, Pictures of Apocalypse, new poems coming out. Um, Ligotti continues to publish uh, quite often in Weird Tales magazine, and he's, he also writes like uh, stories for anthologies. So we might see some more, uh, you know, books of his short stories coming out in the future. We can look forward to that. And I want to close here with something about influence and, um, you know, the extent of, of reading of Ligotti. And so this is coming from Jeff Vandermeer in Vulture. Uh, uh, magazine. He says that Ligotti has been relegated to the status of a cult author. His cause taken up by a devoted but small fan base. And that cause hasn't been helped by four distinct factors. One is Ligotti's not dead yet. Um, the second is he only writes short fiction. The third is he's notoriously reclusive in our social media age where if you really want to get out there, I mean, just to give you an idea, if you're going to try to write a book proposal as a new author, one of the first things that they're going to want in that is how many followers you have in social media and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc. Right? Ligoti doesn't do that sort of thing and he's not going out there to the conventions or anything like that. And then finally, despite being championed uh, by editors at Virgin and Carolyn Graff. He hasn't had a mainstream literary publisher give him the push needed to reach a wider audience. And that's also perhaps a reflection of the current status of uh, popular publishing, right? Publishers expect the authors to do more and more of the publicity work, and Ligotti's just not interested in that. And, you know, how would he be interested in that given some of the things that he has consistently struggled with his entire life and his clear, you know, statements that I want to do this. I'm not interested in doing this thing over here. So there's the biography. I think that gives you a good sense of who this guy Thomas Lagodi is. Now we're going to look at some interviews that reveal what he thinks about his own work and many other topics. Thomas Ligotti has given a number of interviews over the course of his long and still ongoing career. And so I thought it would be useful, as we often do with these, to look at some of the things that he reveals about his own point of view, his writing process, what he values, and how his writing fits in with his overall, let's call it, worldview. And I wanted to begin with an interesting, just portions of an interview from the Lovecraft Easy. And so, you know, Lovecraft is, of course, a very influential writer for Thomas Ligotti. And what they did is they asked some weird fiction writers and editors to send one question each in for Thomas Ligotti, to which he responded 
uh, in some cases at considerable length, in other cases with just a few sentences. So Jeffrey Ford wrote, although you are most associated these days with the fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, the manner in which you employ dark humor in your stories, one of my favorite aspects of the work, is more reminiscent of Poe. What part overall does humor play in your work? Poe also is somebody that Ligotti talks about quite a bit. And here's what Ligotti said. I don't think of humor as a discrete element in anything I've written. I do think of it organic to a number of my later stories. These are often works that have been influenced by Thomas Bernhardt, whose fictions and plays provide a good many chuckles of deranged sort on every page. To some degree, this is also a quality of some of the works of Franz Kafka. Some of his friends who heard him read from his works have written that he giggled all the while. I can imagine doing the same and reading from some of my own stories. In an email exchange some years ago, I was asked about the humor in my stories, and my answer was that the humor makes the blackness blacker still. That sounded true to me at the time, and I think there was some element of truth to it. As I previously remarked, I intend the humor in my writing, and that includes the conspiracy against the human race, to be organic, not adventitious. I think that any humorous effect in my stories and in conspiracy may be a function of exaggerating a grim or nihilist idea or theme. Humor of this kind often appears in my interviews, though I don't think it has arisen very much in this one. I'm not sure why that is. It's quite possible that in responding to the questions by writers of works I know to be praiseworthy, I've attempted to come across as more sophisticated than lighthearted in my responses. And then he goes on and he says, as far back as I can remember, a good many people have remarked on my comic remarks and clownishness. I'm not aware of using humor as a mechanism to engage others into being well disposed towards me. That may be true, but I think it's actually an integral part of my nature. At the same time, my humor in everyday life has, it, has had its origin in suffering. I'm often funniest when I feel terrible. This connects with humor in my stories being organic to their gloomy subjects. It's not exactly gallows humor, though it sometimes arises in dark contexts. I suppose an example, at least I hope it's an example of this type of humor would be in my repetition of the words beef, pork, goat, and the clown puppet. It's the word goat in this sequence that makes it funny to my mind. I actually saw a meat store in a slummy area of Detroit that advertised an inventory of beef, pork, and goat. I made a mental note to use those words in a story someday, which I did. Maybe the eating of goat isn't funny to some people, but I found it a riot. I repeated those words under my breath for the rest of the day. Goat, right? So I think this is actually quite an interesting observation, right? There is a possibility of responding to a dark world, to feeling... Uh, the effects of depression to, you know, seeing others kind of ambling through the tough-minded individuals as William James would have called them and having a laugh about it, right? Not necessarily in the sense of engaging in comedy for its own sake or deliberate humor, but a laugh as a response to the very problem of, of life. Let's go on. He's asked, please expand on your interest in philosophy. I'm interested to know if there are other thinkers apart from Sharon and Schopenhauer whose ideas you find useful. And I love this response on his, his part. Lagodi is very pragmatic and very honest, unpretentious entirely about his interest and use of philosophy. What does he say? I have no interest in philosophy as such, but only in specialized problems that loom large in the thought of some philosophers and philosophical writers. These problems are relatively few and are related to one another. Generally, they would be classed as existential, though for the, the most part in a commonsensical manner, rather than that has to do with persons and phenomena in an everyday, ordinary sense, and not as abstract things that exist only within a wholly conceptual system. 
So I'm no more interested in understanding Nagarjuna's concept of emptiness than I am in Martin Heidegger's concept of Dasein. Hypothetically, such matters are supposed to help me understand who I am and what the world is. Practically, they do not further for me or to me any such understanding, but only provide any idiosyncratic ways of talking about who I am and what the world is. It's as if they subscribe to the bon mot of Oscar Wilde that he lived in fear of not being misunderstood, as if even that much could be established. I, I wish I could say it's just me, but it isn't. Therefore, and in brief, they do not efficiently touch on what I experience and how I function as a cogitating organism. It's not mysterious, then, that I have an interest in more earthly and visceral modes of specialized problems, one of them being the problem of consciousness. I feel that there is such a thing as consciousness and that I experience it in various ways. I take it personally that I exist at all, and having a comprehension of the role consciousness plays and how I feel I exist is important and interesting to me. And then he talks about Chalmers and Dennett. I'm going to skip over that a little bit. Um, but I'll, I'll sum it up with this. At some point in the history of some much discussed problem, someone comes along and says the problem is incoherent, doesn't deserve the attention it's gotten. There are, of course, about a billion other theories of consciousness. And then he goes on and says, I lost my interest in logic in school. And not because I didn't do well in the subject. I can't imagine being engaged by the thought of a philosopher like Quine, who thought of philosophy as a kind of helper discipline, only useful only in furthering the purposes of science. And though I studied the system Schopenhauer worked out in the world as will and representation to uh, both explain how we could know the nature of Kant's thing in itself and why it was complicit in the world being such a crummy place for human beings, I didn't care. And I wasn't convinced by the former, but only cared about the pessimistic conclusions derived from its speculations. As advertised in the subtitle of The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, I was developing a, quote, contrivance of horror. And I used the ideas of others whose thoughts and emotions advanced my own in different ways. I didn't use the ideas of thinkers who didn't interest me and didn't efficiently address specialized problems that concerned me. Now, I hope what I've written above conveys a rough idea why I'm not interested in philosophy. There are uh, other philosophers and philosophical writers who interest me besides the ones mentioned in the conspiracy of the human race. Uh, and he says, you know, actually, it's possible that aside from those philosophers, I've read every philosopher who could possibly interest me, with the exception of untranslated philosophers or whom I would find useful in some way. Philosophers who don't interest me are professionals like, I don't know, Slavo Žižek, or philosophers associated with the indescribable continental school, plus any philosopher that would interest them going back a couple hundred years or so. So, you know, it's very clear from not just stories, but particularly a conspiracy against the human race, that, uh, you know, Ligoti has indeed not just read, but drawn from philosophers quite extensively. But he's, he's not interested in being a philosopher for the sake of being a philosopher. He mentions, you know, uh, a number of people who he doesn't consider to be particularly helpful or interesting. But he, he's perfectly fine to let other people read that stuff if they want to. Then we get a very interesting uh, interview in Fantastic Metropolis between Lagodi and Ned Al Ayad. And Ayad says, do you consider yourself a horror writer? I see your writing and the writing of some of your contemporaries. Uh, D.F. Lewis and Mark Samuels come to mind as forming part of a continuum of the weird, but not necessarily what most people think of horror writing that has its roots in Poe and Lovecraft. And Lagodi says, you know, it's interesting that you should mention the above two authors because I considered mentioning them with respect to this question. However, I don't know enough about either of them to pronounce them as troubled in the sense that Poe and Lovecraft were. Lewis has a family, something that pretty much disqualifies him from the degree of alienation required to be included in the group of authors I mentioned, none of whom were breeders. As for whether or not I consider myself a horror writer, I would assert, for better or for worse, I'm one of the few living individuals 
who actually is a horror writer and nothing else. Now, isn't that a striking uh, claim of allegiance, a self-identification? Um, I had follows up. What is it about novels that turns you off, that novels need morals? And Ligotti says, yeah, something like that. People will accept a short horror story that ends badly. They won't accept this in a horror novel, not after they've read so many hundreds of pages. Horror stories in the short form are like campfire tales or urban legends that are just a way of saying, boo. They have nothing to do with the real world in the minds of most readers. Nevertheless, I think there's a great potential in horror fiction that isn't easily available to realistic fiction. This is the potential to portray our worst nightmares, both private and public, as we approach death through the decay of our bodies. Then to leave it at that, no happy endings, no apologias, no excuses, no redemption, no escape. Some horror writers have done this consistently, but not many. I've been entertained by the works of these writers. It's show business, after all, and beyond that, I felt a momentary satisfaction that someone could be so audacious as to speak ill of the precious gift of life when we're all brainwashed from childhood never to utter a discouraging word. Of course, it's not really possible to avoid affirming life, even when you're writing a horror story defaming it. The act of writing is an affirmation as is the act of suicide. Both are vital and idealistic gestures. Joseph Conrad said that he shunned the supernatural because it wasn't necessary to depict the horror of existence. I wish he hadn't, because the supernatural is the metaphysical counterpart of insanity, the best possible vehicle for conveying the uncanny nightmare of a conscious mind marooned for a brief while in this haunted house of a world and being driv slowly driven mad by the ghastliness of it all. Not the man's humani inhumanity to man sort of thing, but a necessary derangement, a high order of weirdness and desolation built into the system in which we all function. Its emblem is the empty and inexplicable malignity that some of us see in the faces of dolls, mannequins, puppets, and the like. The faces of so many effigies of our own shape made by our own hands and minds seem to be our, own, our way of telling ourselves that we know a secret that is too terrible to tell. The horror writer has the best chance of expressing something of that secret. It's really a lost opportunity or perhaps a blessing that so few take advantage of this potential that lies in horror fiction. Instead, they do the opposite. They discover all the secrets and how trivial they are. A stake through the heart, a silver bullet, an exorcism. We win, all is well, nighty night. Then Ayad asks uh, another really important question. You're extraordinarily frank in your discussion of depression and its effect on your quality of life. It's something that a lot of people still seem to consider taboo. And Ligotti says, Mental illness will remain taboo until it becomes universal. Not that it isn't already universal from a certain perspective, but the very existence of the mentally and emotionally perturbed is a genuine threat to the socioeconomic system in which we are imprisoned. If you're going to be crazy, your craziness better take the same form as that of your boss, the law enforcement authorities, and the President of the United States. Otherwise, you're screwed. Ayad then asks, um, have you ever written anything that you consider too dark or too heavy to publish? And Ligotti says, no, but I've conceived of stories that were just too disturbing for me to write. Now, isn't that interesting? We, we don't get uh, unpublished stories. They are, they're not even articulated onto the page. He says, if you can write something, then it's only so disturbing. Anything truly disturbing can't even be written. Even if it could, no one could stand to read it. And writing is essentially a means of entertainment for the writer and the reader. I don't, I don't care who the writer is. Literature is entertainment or it is nothing. Isn't that a, another interesting way of saying things, right? Um, and then finally, this I think is a really important point, particularly for this worlds of speculative fiction, where we do seek out sort of a, a common narrative universe. He's asked, do your, share, do your stories share a common geography? I get the feeling that, 
that uh, and he names a bunch of different um, um, stories are uh, all taking place in the same region, being set in different parts of the same city, and that you know the the shadow being set in a farming community in the area just outside of the city. So what does Ligotti say? I've been obsessed with the settings of my stories since I began writing. I knew I didn't want to use actual places and place names for the most part. At the same time, I didn't want to invent fictional settings that paralleled actual places or worlds that were wholly fantastic and scrupulously detailed, like those of Mer Mervyn Peake or James Branch Cabell. But I, didn't, I especially didn't want the burden of trying to emulate reality. I, I don't know much about reality in the conventional sense anyway. I can't remember things the way that realistic writers seem so adept at doing. I've been agor agoraphobic since I was 17, so I haven't seen much of the world, and I really deplore research as a stage in writing fiction. What I wanted, ultimately, was to set my stories in places as I saw them in my imagination, rather than describing them from personal observation. So in the sense that the stories are set in my head, rather than in any detailed world, either real or fantastic, I suppose they are all part of the same geography. So what unites the stories is Ligotti's own sensibility, his own intellect, his own imagination, his own obsessions, and the fact that he's willing to write them down. So there is a shared geography. Um, there's another great interview with Wonder Book where he's asked the question, why do you write? And he says, since I was a child, I've used my imagination to escape from life. At the same time, my imagination has plagued me with both reality-based anxieties as well as anxieties based entirely in the imagination, like the fear of hell I was taught to have by the Catholic Church. Paired with a talent for literary composition, a talent it took me over 10 years to refine, I became a writer of horror stories. To my mind, writing is the most important form of human expression, not only artistic writing, but also philosophical writing, critical writing. Art as such, especially programmatic music such as operas, seems trivial to me by comparison, how much, however much pleasure we may get from it. Writing is the most effective way to express and confront the full range of the realities of life. And so, you know, this tells you why he's, he's engaged in it. And he says that, you know, in college I veered from literature to music for a few years, which is the main reason it took me six years to get an undergraduate degree in liberal arts. I've loved music for as long as I can remember. Since my instrument is the guitar, I know every form and style and its history, and I've written the classical, acoustic, and electric forms of this instrument. I think because I have such a love and understanding of music, I realize, to my grief, its limitations. Writing is less limited in the consolations it offers who have lost a great deal in their life. Then he's asked, to what extent are your stories dark mysteries? Do you ever think of them that way? That they're ex explorations of the mysterious? And if so how does that affect how you structure them? And then he says, well, many of my stories have been, in fact, explorations of something mysterious. I've sensed behind the show of physical reality. The works of the French symbolists by way of Poe demonstrated the validity of this approach to writing. The shadow at the bottom of the world was my attempt to explore the sensations instilled in me by the season of autumn. But those sensations were subjective, unreal, and only conveyed my own psychological disposition. Consequently, the story was just another fictional display of my grim philosophy of existence. Later in my life, neither autumn nor any other season filled me with a sense of mystery due to ahedonia, which reduces the visible world to its physical appearances and nothing more. And uh, he's asked, how does the inexplicable inform your fiction? And then he says, it doesn't, at least as far as I can tell. I'm not even sure what you mean by inexplicable. If there's a question to which human beings haven't arrived at a persuasive consensus answer, such as whether or not we have free will or what free will even means as a concept, then I'll settle the question to my own satisfaction and proceed from there. 
I don't feel that human existence has any purpose or meaning. Thus, I write fiction from the perspective of a moral and metaphysical nihilist. If I can't settle a question or if it doesn't interest me, it won't have a place in my life. Now, isn't that interesting? Let's dwell on that one for a moment. And you do see this uh, in, in his uh, um, you know, conspiracy against the human race. Ligotti will stake out his position He's fine if other people have other positions because he realizes that, um, you know, different people are going to arrive at different conclusions and that there's an awful lot involved in the reasoning processes, usually under the surface, by which they get to those, right? And that logic by itself is not going to supply you with the answers and you're not going to have some sort of uh, universal consensus on any of these matters, right? Then he's asked about another term. So inexplicable, nothing inexplicable. He's asked, what does the word ambiguity mean to you as a fiction writer? And he says, doesn't mean anything to me as far as I, I'm aware. Neither does irony. As a writer, I've, I've tried to be as straightforward as possible with respect to how I want a reader to feel and what I want a reader to think after reading one of my stories. And then finally, this is a really interesting one. What are your thoughts on something like Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, right? And he says, well, heroic fiction is a peculiar genre in which I indulged on only one occasion. Being me, I had the hero triumph over his adversary, which I characterize as something like the life principle by killing himself in a manner relevant to the story. And then he goes on and he says, I believe that the figure of the hero and the outline of his journey belongs strictly to mythologies designed to indoctrinate people into a positive vision of life. These journeys are adaptive from an evolutionary perspective. The journeys my characters take are always one of decline and death, which is the journey of average individuals. And also, I believe, will be the journey of the human race as a whole. So he's rejecting, or at least... You know, saying it's kind of irrelevant to me, this this silliness about the hero's journey, right? Um, it's for people who don't want to face up to what reality actually looks like. I have to admit, I'm a little bit, you know, tempted to take on that critique of Campbell and the hero's journey that so many people seem to, to lap up and love. Uh, going on, there's another very interesting interview uh, from the hat rack, he's asked, you write fiction about the darkness of the world and yet so many have gained great pleasure from your works, myself included. How can you reconcile this? Is there something wrong with enjoying such dark fiction, some kind of suicidal mechanism that makes the rare defective organism enjoy being told of its inadequacies? So Ligati says, your question implies there's an ideal human against those whom re those who read dark fiction may be compared, but there is no such organism. All human beings are randomly generated, arbitrar arbitrarily conditioned units. What we would call defects in a given individual is probably best measured by characteristics relevant to its fitness to survive and reproduce. Everything ha else has to do with psychological or sociological conventions and peculiarities. By the, by the broad conventions of modern Western civilization, reading dark fiction is a form of escapist diversion like any other. In this sense, it might be considered one of many survival mechanisms we employ to burn off the cognitive excess endemic to our species. We think too much, and thinking is the destroyer of what we need to live. And what we need are irrational, immediate pleasures or an unreasoning prospect of the same. Nothing of great importance in our lives, what we consider makes them worth living, is rational. This includes pleasurable emotions and sensations derived from a variety of sources, such as sex without reproductive purpose, mountain climbing, and rock and roll. Without these and other irrational enjoyments, life is not worth living for human beings. You could even add to the previous list irrational activities that are not usually considered hedonistic, devoting ourselves to the well-being of others from whose survival we seem to have nothing to gain, prayer or meditation intended to release us from an egoistic survivalist way of life, reproducing more human beings for the continuance of a race that cannot be proved to be worth continuing, and so on. 
All these irrational actions are of the conventional sort, and their purpose is not often questioned. As for psychological or sociological peculiarities, reading dark fiction to burn off the cognitive excess endemic to our species is frequently viewed as a perverse pastime that is especially irrational and practiced with enthusiasm by only a small cadre of human beings. Although it does serve a survival need as an escapist uh, form of diversion like any other, it does so in a roundabout manner that on its face is indefensible and, at a deeper level, is a negation of what makes life worth living. So reading dark fiction is a degenerate indulgence that revels in what is against human life. And then he goes on and he tells a personal story. When I was a child reading horror novels, or horror comic books, I was told by my parents a priest was coming to visit our house, immediately gathered up my horror comics and hid them under the cushion of one of the living room sofas. When the priest entered the house, he was invited by my parents to sit down. Of course, he sat on the cushion of the sofa beneath which I'd hid my horror comics. I was terrified because I believed he knew what I had hidden there. I was a very religious child, and I f felt intensely reading those horror comics was a sin. And uh, he goes on, it was, I felt it was diabolical for me to be enjoying horror comics for the same reason you asked me if it was irreconcilable to take pleasure in reading dark fiction and wallowing in the darkness of the world because it's diabolical and re irreconcilable. Years later, when I'd started writing horror fiction, I asked one of my coworkers who was a born again Christian if he thought I was doing something sinful. He was someone I considered a work friend and had conversely with honesty, uh, conversation with honesty on a variety of subjects. He said he didn't think that writing horror fiction was, was sinful. Later, he wrote a book on the conservative uh, thinker, Russell Kirk, who wrote what I would describe as moral horror stories. Maybe my work friend didn't think writing horror fiction was sinful because he was thinking of moral horror fiction, which is mostly the kind of horror fiction that's written the point is that even when I was in my 20s and an atheist, I still wondered if enjoying horror fiction was sinful, sinful and wrong. Some, some time later in life, I'd cease to care whether reading or writing horror fiction was wrong. I'd read all sorts of literature that was considered sick and evil, and I loved it because it was sick and evil, and I loved it because it was against the human race and its values. Perhaps that's why other readers of horror fiction, or at least certain kinds of horror fiction, get pleasure from it. They can only answer for themselves. You have my confession. And in that we get an answer to this seeming paradoxicality of giving pleasure to others through writing about the darker side of life. Then finally, we have this very interesting uh, discussion that's happening in uh, the Dark Arts Journal. Um, Xavier Reyes uh, is, is asking, uh, questions and says many labels have been used to define you in your work for example nihilist pessimist misanthropic how do you feel towards them is there a better one to encapsulate your worldview and Ligotti says well I feel fine about being referred to as a pessimist in a philosophically unsophisticated my sense my pessimism doesn't have a metaphysical basis like Schopenhauer's will to live, which I never understood as a reading of the universe that would necessarily lead one to a grim view of life. To me, it seems closely related to Bergson's Alain Vital. At the same time, I've used the idea of anima mundi in a few stories to represent the same kind of driving force as the will to live, with the difference that it's a personal evil, not an indifferent type of energy that makes the world move as it does. Schopenhauer's will to live is as difficult to swallow as any other monist explanation for anything, right? And then he talks about panpsychism, and he says that uh, it posits consciousness as a universal, all-pervading phenomena that is the underlying reality of everything we know or can know, though it's perceived by only a few individuals who are somehow tuned to its existence, and he goes on and he, and he says, such persons are rewarded with an insight into a metaphysical reality that supersedes all others. And then he says, even philosophers of mind like Strawson and Chalmers have entertained panpsychism as a viable metaphysical explanation of human consciousness. Uh, if only because it can resolve what Chalmers calls the so-called hard problem of explaining the gap between physical materialism and immaterial consciousness. And now notice what he says, 
I couldn't care less about metaphysical matters that are so monumentally inevident. And then he says, well, then again, most of us would say the same about philosophical pessimism, whose sole contention is that the suffering of sentient beings absolutely negates the value of life. One can only agree or disagree with this philosophy. The foundation of pessimism is not a matter of logic or truth, except when it ventures into matters of metaphysics, ontology, epistemology, morality, or any of the other areas of interest that philosophers see as their remit and purpose. And, and most pessimists do venture into these areas, if only to provide an answer as to why life is as awful as they judge it to be, but they can never succeed in their task by taking these roots. And then he says, it's very much the same with nihilists. Their concern is with meaning and values, that is the absence, endangerment, or disappearance of these components of human life. If suffering were to be eliminated, then meaning and values would not be needed in our lives. Hedonism is enough to keep us going, and the pleasures of the world have been judged sufficient, if only as something to seek. Um, and then he, he goes on and he says, um, should you find yourself suffering badly enough, no meaning or value can help you. But if you're in a state of psycho, uh, physical and emotional well-being, that meaning and value are unnecessary outside of providing ideas that consolidate individuals or societies in their self-image, particularly in relation to the self-images of other individuals and societies. Uh, and, you know, he, he goes on a little bit further and says that, you know, all of this, I don't see this as casting me as a misanthrope. It's just the grandiose aspiration of an ordinary pessimist. Then he's asked, uh, and he gives a long answer to this. Is there anything that weird or supernatural fiction can do that realist fiction cannot? And he says, this is an invitation to pontificate, and I'll try to answer it without wandering too far. Any distinction between supernatural fiction in its various subtypes and realist fiction is non-existent, except in the trivial sense of differentiating among literary genres and the perceived quality of works belonging to one or the other in terms of aesthetics, intelligence, subject matter, and so on. The question itself is certainly of the exclusive concern of readers and critics of supernatural fiction with an inferiority complex regarding the value of writings for which they have an inexplicable sensitivity and appreciation. The more important division is between what we consider the supernatural as opposed to the real. In philosophy, this division can be seen as an argumentation between thinkers who, as an instance, defend idealism against materialism. Most broadly, the conflict is between the supernatural and the, the natural. In an interview with Jorge Luis Borges, uh, the Argentinian writer was asked about how much the depictions of fantastic worlds in his fiction reflected his own beliefs. His answer was this. We don't know if the universe belongs to a realist genre or a fantastic one. My interpretation of Borges' response is not whether the universe is real or fantastic, but whether our consciousness of the universe perceives the universe as real, that is material and dualistic, or supernatural, meaning fantastic, in a probably non-dual sense of the term. While my view is that human beings are parts, things of parts like anything else, I also think that consciousness of ourselves gives us a supernatural quality not possessed by anything else. In effect, we are at odds with the natural and even antagonists towards what we call nature. And he goes on and, and he says that, um, here we go. Um, ultimately, I agree with Borges, along with philosophers and meditation gurus who entertain the idea of panpsychism, that we don't know if the universe belongs to a realist genre or a fantastic one. So we, we, we have to be a little bit agnostic on these matters, right? And then he's asked, um, what would you say are the aims of your fiction? And he says, well, all of, my, all of my stories have had their origins in a mood or attitude I wanted to convey to the reader. When I first began writing, I realized my subject matter would necessarily derive from my own wife, life. I've never been a worldly person. Thus, I never had at my command either much in the way of practical knowledge or a wide range of lived experiences. And this has been mostly due to the psychological disorders from which I suffered nearly all my life. 
most specifically from the age of 17 to the present. I've been subject to clinical mood disorders. I can understand why someone would dismiss everything I've written as being nothing more than a symptom of my diagnoses relating to anxiety and depression, thereby making my literary output all but worthless. From my side, I can't take seriously literary works that haven't in some distinctive way emerged from what purportedly normal people would call an unhealthy affect. Major and minor works of literature have been produced by authors at both poles or along the continuum of emotional wellness or sickness. And then he goes on and he says, um, as for my relationship to what I've written, I can't say that this has changed in any way since my earliest attempts as a writer. Certainly my writings haven't changed in their emotional or intellectual aspects. For instance, the first story I wrote that didn't find its way to a wastebasket is about an anthropology professor who suffers from depression during the darker months of the year. As an academic project and as a diversion from his personal darkness, he travels to a small town to investigate a supernatural cult whose mythos is based on the antinatalist beliefs of the early Christian Gnostics. Naturally, things don't end well for the professor. Forty years later, Antinatalism is a prominent theme in my nonfiction book, Conspiracy Against the Human Race, and a later pro-mortalist story called Metaphysica Morum. And then this is a, a very interesting, and it's, it's good to sort of close with. If we were to press you for one story of yours that best defines you as a writer, which one would it be and why? And he says, to this question... I usually say the shadow at the bottom of the world, both for its prose style and its plot of a rural locale that harbors a malignantly anti-human force or fundamental that is alien and menacing with respect to human values. So that's Ligotti's own take on if there is anything that's at the essence, the paradigm expressing his own mindset, his musings, his work product, that's the one that it would be. So a lot of very interesting insights there that we can follow out through the philosophical themes that we see in a selection. We're not going to try to cover every single narrative that he has uh, generated, but at least some of them. There are a number of very interesting philosophical themes running throughout Thomas Ligotti's writings, his uh, short stories, and the conspiracy on the human race, and also found, as we saw in the interviews with him as well. And I'm not going to claim that this is the most absolutely central or important theme, although I do think it's up there if we wanted to say like the top five or top ten. But one of the themes that I found by far the most interesting, at least at this point in my reading of Ligotti, is that of the puppet, the mannequin, the dummy, and how it applies to us. And he treats it in a number of different ways. I think the place to start for us is indeed the conspiracy against the human race. And this is about halfway through. This is in the chapter, Who Goes There? And he's considering a number of different, let's call them metaphysical and moral commitments that most people tend to make that he thinks are fundamentally mistaken, but it's inevitable that we're going to fall into them. Among them is the idea that we have some sort of lasting kernel of identity that we call a self. And we've already talked a little bit about that. But another one is the matter of determinism. And, you know, he says that in the history of philosophical lucubration, arguments for determinism are traditionally the most argued against. Why is this so, aside from the fact that it turns the human image into a puppet image? And then he goes on and he says, well, you know, there's moral responsibility, but I, I, we're less interested in that at this point. Um, you know, Ligotti is, is willing to take on the idea of determinism. 
And you know, he's not the only uh, author to, to do so. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that when people embrace something like a determinism, a determinism for most people, they wound up, they wind up getting labeled as being nihilistic. And you could think of, uh, you know, what we often call compatibilism. You know, there's, the, there's you know, libertarianism saying we do have free will. Uh, if it's very extreme, it says, ah, we can decide anything we want to. And then there's, you know, determinism at the other side saying, no, no, everything that we do is ultimately causally determined. And then there's sort of a middle position that's a, a big, messy landscape of compatibilism where it's you know, saying, well, determinism does hold, but maybe we can be our own causes at times, or you know, our freedom goes into a determinism, comes out of it, goes back into it. And what does it actually take, though, for us to be free? What would it take for us to be free, not in an absolute sense, but just in a smaller sense, to, to not be merely a dummy, a mannequin, a puppet, something that is controlled by strings, by uh, programming, by something else. And, you know, determinism, the threat of it that it poses to us, the worries about us being puppets, is that when we think that we're free, we're actually just determined to, to buy that. And, and Ligotti, you know, says something here in this section. It does not seem wildly improbable that determinations have been made in our psyches that make some people determinists and others indeterminists. If we could only know how these determinations work, we would be able to answer the only interesting question in the debate pitting free will against determinism. Why argue for one side or the other? The answer to this question would abort all rivalry in this manner, since it would bring to light the reason why any philosopher would engage in a conflict more vain than most in his discipline, right? And so, you know, that's, that's an interesting observation. Much later in um, a, a chapter called Autopsy on a Puppet, he talks about uh, in horror stories, he says, there's an assortment of figures that appear as walk-ons or extras whose purpose is to lend their spooky presence to a narrative for atmosphere alone. Well, the real bogey is something else altogether. Puppets, dolls, and other caricatures of the human often make cameo appearances as shapes sagging in the corner of a child's bedroom or lolling on the shelves of a toy store. There are also dismembered limbs and decapitated heads of mannequins that have been relegated to spare parts strewn about in an old warehouse where such things are stored or sent to die. As backdrops or bit players, imitations of the human form have a symbolic value because they seem connected to another world. One that is all harm and disorder. The kind of place we sometimes fear is the model for our own home ground, which we must believe is passably sound and secure, or at least not an environment where we might mistake a counterfeit person for the real thing. So that's the you know, one of the underlying threats of the dummy, right? Then he says, but in fiction, as in life, mistakes are sometimes made. When they are, one of those humanoid replicas may advance to the center of a story's action. And now we get another wrinkle to this theme, and he talks about Hoffman's The Sandman. The protagonist discovers the too perfect girl to who he had proposed marriage is really just an automaton. This shakes him up so greatly he's committed to an asylum until he recovers his senses, right? And um, he, he goes on, as Hoffman's story goes, many lovers, to be quite convinced they were not enamored of wooden dolls, would request their mistresses to sing and dance a little out of time, to embroider and knit and play with their lapdogs while listening to reading, and above all, not merely to listen, but sometimes to talk in such a manner as presupposed actual thought and feeling. And he goes on and he says, uh, there are many abominable fates in horror stories, and among them is that of Nathaniel, you know, finding out that you have been engaging with something that is not human, that is really just a, a mock-up. But then he says, worse still is when a human being becomes objectified as a puppet, a doll, or some other caricature, 
of our species and enters a world that he or she thought was just a creepy little place inside of ours. What a jolt to find oneself a prisoner in this sinister sphere, reduced to a composite mechanism looking out on the land of the human, or one which we believe to be human by any definition of the word, and to be exiled from it. Just as we know that dreams are merely reflections of what happens in our lives, we are also quite sure that puppets, dolls, and other caricatures of our species are only reflections of ourselves. In a sane world, no correspondence could exist between those artificial anatomies and our natural flesh. That would be too strange and awful for things to be confused in such a way. More strange and awful, of course, would, to be, to, would be to find this a living confusion. Life as the dream of a puppet. So, you know, this is uh, putting out a number of different horrific possibilities. Near the end of that particular essay, Autopsy on a Puppet, he says that we have long since fallen from nature's arm. Everywhere around us are natural habitats, but within us is the shiver of startling and dreadful things. Simply put, we are not from here. If we vanish tomorrow, no organism on this planet would miss us. Nothing in nature needs us. And he goes on to talk about mainlanders, uh, God, and he says, we move among living things, all those natural puppets with nothing in their heads. But our heads are in another place, a world apart where all the puppets exist not in the midst of life, but outside of it. We are those puppets, those human puppets. We are crazed mimics of the natural prowling about for a piece that will never be ours, and the medium in which we circulate is that of the supernatural. So, this uh, theme of the, the puppet turns out to be quite important. And let's actually take a look at a very recent uh, in involvement with this, which has to do with the smalls, the little people, right? And this is in the spectral link. Uh, it's one of the two stories in there. And it begins with um, the narrator being accused of being a bigot by his parents. Um, he's talking to his doctor and his uh, mother and father resorted to using the word shameful little bigot quite a lot. Why? Because they were on vacation and they saw a car full of little people who are, you know, growing into uh, uh, the world that they know. Small, small country is the name of that. And um, I'm not going to try to summarize the entire thing, but it's interesting. There's, there's a whole discussion here of going to the library and trying to uncover information about these people. And he says, in no time at all, I could find out all I needed to know about the small people. And possibly what I learned would terminate or at least temper my fear of them or even alleviate or dissolve entirely my hatred of their kind. So he's trying to, you know, self uh therapize himself out of these uh, emotions that not only is he feeling and not happy with, but his parents are responding to as well. And he says, I could hardly find a mention of these creatures, not even in the form of records or statistics relating to them. Ultimately, I was forced to conclude nothing was being hidden from me or the rest of the world. At least it wasn't being hidden deliberately, consciously. That would have been an impossible task. Um, and he says, I'm not saying no one has ever ruminated on the phenomenon of the small people. No doubt everyone has pondered their existence at some time or another, but such considerations have never been sustained long enough to create a body of inquiry and knowledge. Before pen could be put to paper and an expedition launched, some negating in curiosity set in that dissipated any spur to action or any action that resulted in authoritative books and peer-reviewed essays and specialized journals. And so what he's recognizing here is that, you know, although people know about the small people, nobody seems that interested in them. He meets uh, a friend who uh, also dislikes, fears, hates the small people, and they actually have a confrontation, right? So they wind up um, running into these people after spying on them, and uh, here's a description. Um, 
They didn't speak a word, neither to us nor amongst one another. Nothing shocked me about that, but it did add to the disorienting unreality of the situation. For a time, they stayed in place. Paradoxically, they appeared gigantic. Gigantic for toys, given their toy-like aspect. Their clothes seemed painted on them. Their faces were so smooth, gleaming in the moonlight without any of the characteristic qualities of flesh. They were also unwrinkled, unworn by time, and somehow immortal. That is how they had always been, created somehow, but not developed in stages from birth to their present age. There had been no process of coming to age for them, I thought later. No birth or death or all the things in between that trouble our own existence, or at least troubled us when we attended to them. There is only going through the motions, a pretense of life. In a way, they were a mirror of us, of what we wanted for ourselves. They marked time and nothing else. Time to do this, time to do that, time to make an another town, time to relocate, having poisoned a new landscape with small country. And later on, and this is why he's talking to a doctor, he's going to realize the implications of him being adopted. He comes to see, and there is a spectral link between him and the small people, that in addition to human beings and smalls, there's an intermediary category. He says, um, I realized that uh, about half of the people in town as real and half as halfers, half small people, half real. And he gets very good at telling that. And then he realizes that his parents are halfers. He talks about uh, his, his father and his mother um, saying, uh, though the sun was shining on my mother's smooth face, her big eyes weren't squinting. They didn't look left or right, up or down. They were just big eyes like a big doll would have. The longer I sat with my parents eating hamburgers, hot dogs, and potato salad, um, uh, you know, uh, my, my parents did what they had to do in order to be real parents to me, but we weren't biologically related. I was adopted as an infant. And now I knew I was only a prop, something to aid them in not being found out for what they were. And so he goes in and um, eventually he's finding his parents in bed. It must have been about the middle of the night when I entered my mother and father's bedroom, they were lying on their backs in bed, the moonlight glowing in my father's smi slightly smiling face and concentrating stare, as well as on my mother's smooth face and big eyes, which were open. Both their eyes were open. I don't know why. Maybe they didn't sleep. It wasn't as if I was the sort of person to peek into his parents' bedroom to see what they were doing. He says, Dad, Mom, listen, I want to tell you something. And then he says, I'm a shameful little bigot. I hate the small people. I hate them for all I'm worth. But more than I hate the small people, I hate you. Then I jumped on the bed and was all over them with knives I'd gotten from the kitchen. Push, 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 chop, chop, chop. They didn't make a sound the whole time. I can tell you one thing. Halfers aren't soft like the smalls. I really had to work on those things that called themselves my parents. All right? So a confrontation motivated by hate and fear between a child adopted by half mannequins, half smalls. Uh, let's talk about another interesting uh, set of stories. So in uh, Noctuary, uh, we have this uh, mad night of atonement. And here we actually have a, you know, professor or doctor, whatever, whatever we want to call him. Uh, and he is, um, there it is, Dr. Frank Francis Hoxhausen, right? A scientist. And he brings people in to check out his new invention. But he begins with a story. He says, I'd like to open my lecture with the following anecdote. There's a legend uh, that I learned while traveling here and there. It seems there was a sorcerer, an alchemist, who dreamed of transforming the world through the creation of an artificial man. This man, the sorcerer dreamed, would not be subject to the flaws and limitations of the former type, but would instead live through many lifetimes, accumulating the knowledge and wisdom it would one day use to serve and improve the human race. The sorcerer, like all dreamers of this kind, was intent on his vision, 
and not particularly concerned with its ramifications in a larger scheme of things. So he goes to, to build it. We'll, we'll talk about, we're going to skip over that a little bit. And then we find it was not long after this regimen that the omnipotent one realized what the sorcerer was intending to do. And so it happened that the creature, strong and well-coordinated, but still a child in its mind, was awakened in the dead of night by a voice that cursed it as a blasphemy and an abomination. The voice bid the creature to go to its fall maker in the attic where he had sequestered himself among evil books and impure devices. Confused and terrified, the creature ascended several stairways and entered the attic. And there he found the sorcerer. Sounds like... Frankenstein up to this point, doesn't it? But there's a big twist. He found the sorcerer motionless and hung on the wall like something in a puppet maker's workshop, his dark robe grazing the dusty floor and his head drooping down. Acting upon a mechanical impulse beyond dread or despair, the creature raised his master's head and saw it was now no more than wood and wax. The sight was a maddening one, and it did not take long for the creature to find the rope with which it hung itself from the rafters of the attic. So this, you know, playing God, you could say, leads to being transformed back into mere material on the part of the sorcerer. And then uh, what is the actual invention? So uh, it's, it's a, a ray, and there's all these uh, puppets, right? There is a stage area occupied by imitations of the human image. Puppets and marionettes were strung up at various elevations, relieved of their weight by fragile glistening threads. Mannequin po posed in a paralyzed leisure, which looked at once grotesque and idyllic. Other dummies in an odd assortment of dolls sat in miniature chairs here and there, simply sprawled about the floorboards, sometimes propping each other back to back. But among these mock people, as it became evident the longer one gazed at the stage, were hidden real ones who rather ably imitated the imitations. So he says, uh, you see how things are, ladies and gentlemen, whereas we have been dreaming so long of creating perfect life in the laboratory, the cre creator holds sacred only the crude facsimile which echoes or expresses his own will. He has always been far ahead of us envisioning a completed work at the end of history and he has no more time to linger, linger over the vital stage of universal evolution because no truth or life can exist in us as we are. For truth and life can exist only in the mind, the will of the creator. And we have stubbornly made it our business to do nothing but oppose that mind, that will. We are simply the raw material for his beloved puppets, which reflect to perfection the truth of the creator and are the ideal dwellers in his paradise of ruins. And after his chosen ones are triumphantly installed in that good place, the creator has some wonderful stories to tell us as a way to pass the hours of eternity. And then he says, we may take our place among the puppets as the tableau you see before you will serve to demonstrate. For there are at this moment certain faces insinuated among this elect company that do not belong, that stand out in an unpleasant way. How to bring them into the fold is the question and the answer, if you will turn for a moment and direct your eyes towards the balcony, the answer spotlight is the puppet machine, right? The thing that will transform those into puppets. Now, he says this is not an everlasting conversion, right? But for a, a, a little while, it turns people into puppets. Isn't that an interesting prospect? Now, let's talk about just several other stories as well. Um, you know, Dream of a Mannequin pretty easily suggests itself, right? We have a uh, psychiatrist who has a Miss Loker who has been coming to him, and she is having uh, bad dreams, right? And she winds up being... Um, in, uh, in with some, some mannequins, right? An awesome lo load of new clothes has arrived to adorn a display of mannequins. Their unclothed bodies repel her touch because they are neither warm nor cold as only artificial bodies can be. And she says, time to stop dancing and get dressed, sleeping beauties, right? And 
The dream changes before the dresser is able to put one stitch on the drum- dummies who stare at her, uh, stare at nothing with anticipating eyes, right? Um, and what we find is, is all this discussion of what is happening in her dreams. And we have the uncanny being mentioned here as well, right? And uh, the psychiatrist says, you can probably imagine my reaction to the above psychic yarn. Every loose skein I followed led me back to you, because uh, he's talking to somebody who is very good for uh, not just hypnotizing, but planting suggestions. And then a bit later, right? Um, he is going to try to track down Mrs. Locher, Miss Locher, and uh, isn't able to make a lot of success, right? And what we find then is he starts having dreams himself. And so here is uh, one of them. In the whitened hallway, Um, there are things that look like people dressed as dolls or else dolls made up to look like people. I remember being confused about which it was and they're lying up and down the floor, the top of the stairway, even on the stairs themselves as they disappear into the darker regions below. When I emerge from the bedroom, I see their eyes shining in the white darkness and their heads are turned in all directions, paralyzed. Yes. With terror, I merely return a fixed gaze, wondering if my eyes are shining the same as theirs. And here's where the horror comes in. Then one of the doll people slouching against the wall on my left turns its head haltingly on a stiff little neck and looks straight at me. Worse, it talks and its voice is a horrible parody of human speech. Even more horrible are its words when it says, Become as we are, sweetie. Die into us. Suddenly I began to feel very weak, as if my life were being drained out of me. Summoning all my willpower, I managed to rush back to my bed, which ends the dream, right? And this dream is an intrusion of the uncanny into his life. And then, you know, he goes on and he says, In Miss Loker, I believe you've sent me an embodiment of your deepest convictions, Suppose I grant she was somehow a dream. Suppose I allow she was not a girl, but actually a thing without a self, an unreality that in accord with your vision of existence, dreamed it was a human being and not just a fabricated impersonation of our flesh. You would have me entertain such thoughts. You would have me think there's some mysterious affinity among the things of this world and other worlds. So what if there is? I I don't care anymore, right? So this is interesting. It's almost like Ligotti in talking to this other character um, is talking to his own views on things. He believes we don't actually have selves. He believes that our consciousness is something too much, you know, sort of a blot on existence that leads us to believe in all sorts of things that aren't really the case. Uh, Let's look at two other stories and then maybe we'll have to wrap up because this is already growing quite long. So in Dr. Voke and Mr. Veach, we have the two of them meeting up and um, we have a a dummy involved, right? Within the darkness ahead, there suddenly appears a tall rectangle like a ticket seller's booth at a carnival. The lower part is composed of wood and the upper part of glass. Its interior is lit up by an oily red glare. Slumped forward on its seat in the side of the booth as if asleep is a well-dressed dummy, nicely fitting black jacket and vest with bright silver buttons, a white high-collar shirt with silver cufflinks and a billowing cravat which displays a pattern of moon and stars. Because his head is forwardly inclined, the dummy's only feature of note is the black sheen of its painted hair. Now, notice how well this dummy has been depicted, almost like a human being, right? Veach approaches the booth a little cautiously. He seems to be most interested in the figure within. Through a semicircular opening in the glass, Veach slides his hand into the booth, apparently with the intention of giving the dummy's arm a shake. But before his own arm creeps very far towards its goal, several things occur in succession. 
The dummy casually lifts its head and opens its eyes. It reaches out and places its wooden hand on Veach's hand of flesh, and its draw drops open to dispense a mechanical laugh. Ya ha 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 ha, ya ha 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 ha. Resting his hand away from the dummy, Veach staggers backward a few steps. The dummy continues to give forth its mocking laughter, which flaps its way into every niche of the loft and flies back as peculiar echoes. The dummy's face is vacant and handsome. Its eyes roll like mad marbles. Then, from out of the shadows behind the dummy's booth, steps someone who is every bit as thin as Veach, though much taller. His outfit his outfit is not unlike the dummy's, but his clothes hang on him, and what there is left of his sp- sparse hair falls like torn rags across his bone-white scalp. Did you ever wonder, Mr. Veach, Volk begins, did you ever wonder what it is that makes the animation of a wooden dummy so terrible to see, not to mention to hear. Listen to it. I mean, really listen. ya ha 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 A series of sounds that becomes excruciating, excruciatingly eloquent when uttered by the ticket man. They are a species of poetry that sings what should not be sung, that speaks what should not be spoken. But what in the world is it laughing about? Nothing, it would seem. No clear motives or impulses make the dummy laugh, and yet it does. But what is the laughter for, you might well ponder. It it seems to be for your ears alone, doesn't it? It seems to be directed at every part of your being. It seems knowing. And it is knowing, but in another way from what you suppose, in another direction entirely. It is not you the dummy knows. It is only itself. The question is not what is the laughter for. The question is... Where does it come from? And then he goes on, think about it. Wood waking up. I can't put it any clearer than that. And let's not forget about the painted hair and lips, the glassy eyes. These two are aroused from a sleep that should never have been broken. These two are now part of a tingling network of dummy nerves, alive and aware in a way we cannot begin to imagine. This is something too painful for tears. And so the dummy laughs in your face, trying to give vent to a horror that was no part of his old home of wood and paint and glass. But this horror is the very essence of its new home. Our world, Mr. Veach, that is what is so terrible about the laughing ticket man. A little bit earlier in that, he says, while this dummy does terrorize you, his terror is actually greater than yours. So we have this, I mean, if if the dummy remains a mannequin, a machine, merely programmed, Everything's okay for it, but as soon as it has consciousness, it starts to realize what kind of existence it has, and terror and horror is part of that. The last thing I'll I'll bring up is in the story uh, Nethyscurial, which um, has a section, The Puppets in the Park. Right. And he, the, the, the narrator says that um, I was walking along an indefinite route and I came to a clearing where an audience had assembled for a late night entertainment. Strings of colored lights had been hung. The people seated on these benches were all watching a tall illuminated booth. It was the kind of booth used for puppet shows with wild designs painted across the lower part and a curtained opening at the top. The curtains were now drawn back and two clownish creatures were twisting about in a glary light which emanated from inside the booth. They leaned and squawked and awkwardly batted each other with soft paddles they were hugging in their little arms. So far, so good, right? It's, you know, I'm seeing people at a puppet show. And then it turns to horror. Suddenly, they froze at the height of their battle. Slowly, they turned around and faced the audience. Okay, so now the dummies are alive, conscious, and they're facing this mass of people. It seemed that the puppets were looking directly at the place I was standing behind the last row of benches. Their misshapen heads tilted and their glassy eyes stared right into mine. So now it's not just the audience, it's you. Then I noticed the others were doing the same. All of them had turned around on the benches and with expressionless faces and dead puppet eyes held me to the spot. Although their mouths did not move, they were not silent. But the voices I heard were far more numerous than was the gathering before me. They were the voices I'd been hearing as they chanted confused words into the depths of everyone's thoughts, fathoms below the level of their awareness. The words still sounded hushed and slow, monotonous phrases mingling like the sequences of a fugue. 
But now I could understand these words as even more voices picked up the chant at different points and overlapped one another, saying, Amid the rooms of our houses, across moonlit skies, throughout all souls and spirits, behind the faces of the living and the dead. Right? So, all of us beings. So we see this really centrally important theme. Again, not necessarily the absolutely most. It's one of many interesting themes, but it is certainly the one that in my readings of these uh, these stories and, uh, you know, uh, Ligotti's essay, uh, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, captivated me the most. And so given how much time we've spent on this with, I don't want this to go over long. This is where we have to wrap up. So once again, to all those viewers who've been with me to the end, thanks for hanging out. We do these every month and I will say a special thank you to the people who I don't remember who recommended and then voted for incorporating Thomas Ligotti's works into worlds of speculative fiction. 